Got another installment of the gospel of God that all the news about God is, is good because God is good. Every aspect of his character is good. His, his judgments are good. His mercy is good. His sovereignty is good. He is good in all of his attributes. Even those things that, that can momentarily bring pain. He, he truly has sovereignly ordered all things according to the counsel of his own will. And he always has a good purpose in all that he does actively and all that he allows to happen. He, he truly is sovereign over all creation. And there's nothing that goes beyond or escapes his grasp. Um, I want to look at a specific incident in the, the life of Christ that is mentioned in three of the Gospels. It's in all three of the synoptics um, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And we're going to look at Luke's account of Jesus uh, crossing the Sea of Galilee with his disciples and him falling asleep in the midst of the boat. What we're going to look at this morning is the good news of God's sovereignty over circumstance. He truly is sovereign in the midst of every circumstance. So we're, we're going to see this pointed to very directly this morning. And if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, have submitted your entire way to him, you will doubtlessly come away from this message and this truth of his sovereignty over circumstance. You'll come out with, from this encouraged and with confident direction as to how to brave the rough waters that very likely lay ahead of us. Um, we are in the, the midst of this you know, pandemic and then layered on top of that are many other uncertainties that are the storms that are raging around us. We have the uncertainty of the life and health of loved ones. We have the uncertainty of finances in the area of our employment or other means of income that we might have and how unstable that that would appear in this moment there i guess to to cut it short just to say there are many many legitimate reasons for concern in this hour and, and that are th those are the storms of life that that are common to man born myself in 1964 so in the course of my life there has been several upheavals you know social unrest that i can vaguely remember in the 60s and early 70s the, the vietnam war there was high points like the the moonshot and and then you know the the malaise of the late 70s and then coming into the early 80s and living out on the farm in the early 80s was a a very uncertain thing and then being associated through my my parents you know those were uncertain years when when the farm prices weren't uncertain the weather was uncertain and so this is maybe the most uh, concerning crisis that i've witnessed in my life especially in my adult life so i don't want to diminish what we are what we are facing in the the concerns that have arisen in anybody's life. So I guess I just want to say before I even read the scripture this morning that I'm not here to try to invalidate your feelings of uncertainty or even to the point of, you know, fear. Fear we don't have to live in as, as believers, but... Uh, the feeling of fear is something that will for sure test every one of us. If it hasn't already, it will in the days to come. 
So what do we do with those things? How, how do we rest in him it is the main reason I feel like I was led to this passage of scripture this morning to bolster our confidence. Hopefully, I'm not telling you anything this morning that you don't already know, but I want to be like the Apostle Peter who would not fail to stir you up through remembrance of things already spoken. Stir you up through the the rehearsing of the truth that does not change, the truth that we are established in, that gives us firm foundation for our decisions. Because the very last thing that you want to do in this hour is to be moved to make hasty decisions based on fear. Uh, way too much of that may have already transpired. And there's no reason for us as believers to add to that by making hasty and fear-based uh, decisions personally. And, and beyond that, to the degree that we have influence over others for that type of, of panic to, to spread. So we're going to see how peace is arrived at in the midst of storm today. I just want to read a few verses out of Luke chapter 8, starting in verse 22. Read down through these. It says, now it happened on a certain day that he got into a boat with his disciples, and he said to them, let us cross over to the other side of the lake. And he launched out but as they sailed, he fell asleep, and a windstorm came down the lake, down on the lake, and they were filling with water and were in jeopardy. And they came to him and awoke him, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. Then he awoke, he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the waters, and they ceased. And there was a calm. But he said to them, Where is your faith? And they were afraid and marveled, saying to one another, Who can this be? For he commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him. Very first thing I want to point out, we're just going to go through this story you know, piece by piece and see how this was all orchestrated by the Lord to bring them to a place of awestruck wonder and peace. And that's the place where we should abide in these turbulent times. Just, now it happened on a certain day. It was on a certain day. And, and I believe that the that the primary reason that it is called out that way here in, in the in the Gospel of Luke, it was a certain day. So it was a day of the Lord's choosing. It, it was a day when he had purposed for this situation to arise to be able to show his own power, to be able to show himself strong on their behalf, and to build their faith, to build their confidence. And that is 100% of the time. Maybe, it may not even be the primary purpose, but it is always a purpose, and very often a primary purpose of God in allowing us to go through the rough waters. We are in a position where we can be established in greater degrees of faith. Just thinking back to uh, great faith building opportunities in the life of, of those in scripture, David. David was one that when he faced his Goliath, he had first faced the lion and the bear in relationship to his shepherding duties. So why was he faced with a, a lion and a bear earlier in his life? Because there was a giant coming and God was preparing him to glorify himself in the midst 
of a great crisis, a crisis in his nation and a military crisis in that instance. So this happened on a certain day that he got into a boat with his disciples. And, and that was uh, one of the keys to understanding how this all broke down for him and his disciples in relationship to this storm they found themselves in is he was in the boat before the storm. They did not set out into the teeth of a storm. They set out together. And, and this is something that we have to be incredibly uh, focused upon that we are establishing, we are establishing, uh, the kind of relationship where we have a, a constant abiding presence of the Lord in our life, that we are conscious that he is with us, that he will never leave us and never forsake us. You know, lo, I'm with you, he says, even to the end of the age. This is his promise to his people. And basically, he is in the boat with us. You know, there, there's been many times I've seen just recently on the news where the statement would be made by those in authority, hey, we're all in this together. Hey, we are all in the same boat. Well, I don't know that that's true in the sense that there's a couple of different boats we may be in. If we're in the boat that Jesus is in, we have a whole different perspective and different outcome that we can that we can be looking forward to if we go through this storm with him. So let's look a little farther on down. He was with them before the storm began and then a little farther down in verse 22 says here that and he said to them, "Let us cross over to the other side of the lake." Now we see their reaction, we see the uncertainty and their questioning a little later on of does he care for us does he have our best interest at heart in other words how in the world can he sleep in the boat when we're fixing to die if something drastic doesn't happen he up front establishes them in his already spoken word look at what he tells them let us cross over to the other side of the lake. He had told them that they were going to arrive on the other side of the lake. He says, let us, we're going together, we're crossing over to the other side of the lake, to this, this Sea of Galilee, to this inland sea, freshwater sea that, that was referred to here as this lake. We are crossing over to the other side. When he takes them on later on in saying that they had little faith, that where it, he asked them, where is your faith? That was what their faith was to be expressed in was him and what he had spoken. He had already spoken to them that they were going to cross to the other side. Then they doubted. So, when we hear what the Lord is saying to us, uh, much of the preparation, and we've been speaking this for years, that we were preparing for hard times, that we were preparing for God's judgment upon the nation, his, his redemptive purposes to be revealed in placing stresses on the nation that would lead to a great awakening. This is no time for a fear response. But it is time that we should have been prepared because God has been preparing us through placing his word within us. He's been telling us, right now you will find it more difficult to stand in what the Lord is saying right now than you will to stand upon the word that he spoke to you that you've already been established in in days past. I'm not saying it's too late to prepare. It's never too late to repair, prepare. But we'll never get the time back from the past when we should have been preparing a firm foundation of his word underneath us. For those of us that have been preparing, 
have been hiding our his word in our hearts so that we would not have a fear response but a following response an acknowledging of his word and his declaration that we make it to the end i mean he he never leaves us he never forsakes us and his destiny is sure for us it's as sure for us this morning as it was you know six, eight weeks ago before this had really become a thing. This thing we find ourselves in the midst of did not take him by surprise. And look at what also they see in the midst of their riding out this storm with the Lord. They launched out together. I, I That's my added word there. But they launched out. But as they sailed... He fell asleep. Now, instead of seeing his peace and resting in the reality that he had already told them, we're crossing over to the other side and looking at him in the bow of the boat, sleeping, he, they find him asleep. They would interpret his sleep as uncaring when his sleep was simply the manifestation of his peace. He had peace enough that he could sleep, he could rest in the midst of the storm, knowing with confidence that they were going to make it through. He knew where they were going to be an hour, a few hours. I'm not sure how long it takes to cross this lake. I guess it, a lot of it depends on whether the wind was behind them or headlong against them. But regardless of what it was, he knew the end from the beginning and we are metaphorically here in the boat with the one who knows the end from the beginning he has purpose and destiny for us in the midst of this he will do things in us through this storm what he did for his disciples and the storm that he launched them out into he revealed their weakness of their faith. And if that's what has transpired up to this point, if you see yourself uh, running about like your hair's on fire and not knowing which way to turn and, and really being uh, gripped by fear. Now, I can tell you without any... Uh, without any fear of, of leading you astray, that fear and faith are, are opposites. If you're walking in faith, you will faith in the love of God, the presence of God, and his goodness at providing us a way through trial to come out the other side. If you're if you're afraid in that in the midst of that, then that is weak faith. And the very best thing that can happen to you, the very, first, first, uh, the very best thing that could happen to these disciples is that they were placed in a position to see their faith tested and found wanting. They were walking with him every day. They were seeing amazing miracles. They were seeing all sorts of things that should have been resulting in greater and greater faith. But they would have never questioned their faith had it not come up against circumstances that it was not strong enough to provide a faith response rather than a fear response. So the very best thing, if, if you're sitting here feeling some condemnation over being fearful in these days, just know that's the very best thing that could have happened to you. These, th th This virus and these economic upheavals and anything else that might be hitting your world sideways at this moment that is creating a disturbance of some sort that has placed you into fear, it is the goodness of God. It is the goodness of God that he places you in a position to express fear, not, not for the sake of, of punishing you with fearful thoughts, 
but for revealing in you that those fearful thoughts, those, the, those apprehensions about the future, lack of an ability to rest in Christ, that those things, once, you, once expressed, once experienced, once confessed before the Lord, point you to the same place they pointed him, pointed these disciples in a interaction with Jesus, an interaction with their master. Uh, I just want to encourage you that once we've seen his, his peace in the midst of the storm, that they seen that they seen the storm and its danger there at the end of verse 23 and the wind came down on the lake and they were filling with water and were in jeopardy this is a reality i'm not saying that jesus by sleeping in the front of the boat was protecting them he wasn't like their lucky charm that was placing them and put up greater sideboards on the boat and didn't allow any water to come in. No, they were in the midst of a windstorm and water was coming in and filling the boat and they were in jeopardy. The scripture says it here that it was, they were experiencing danger. Danger was in front of them. Jesus was sleeping in the boat with them. What do you do with that? So I guess what I'm saying this morning is if you find yourself in a place where the peace of God seems to be at best distant and you are <clears throat> being or at least being confronted with having to deal with great fears, the best thing you can do is what they did. They, they, they expressed great wisdom in their approach to approaching Jesus. Verse 24, that they came to him and awoke him saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. One of the other synoptic gospels, <clears throat> or I think maybe both of them, expresses the idea of, do you not care that we are perishing? But here, Master, Master, we are perishing. This is the reality of the, of the wisest choice that we can make, is to be honest with God, to truly show him our true emotions, bring to him whatever it is we're dealing with, how, whatever it is that we find ourselves struggling with in this moment, don't just stuff it down and say, well, it, it, would, be a, it would be a bad thing for me to, to approach God in that manner. No, no, be sure that you approach him with the truth of your heart. If you're in fear, express that fear. If you feel that he has abandoned you, I, I'll for sure tell you that's not true. He has not abandoned you. But if you feel like he has, approach him with that. Be like these disciples who, who boldly came before him, awoke him, and spoke to him the truth of how they felt. They start out in the right place. Master, master, we are perishing. The implication there, of course, was how can you sleep in a time that we're in danger? They had misinterpreted his silence, his peace, as a lack of caring. Uh, Peter speaks to us from, from his letters and says to, to cast our cares upon him because he cares for us. When care, even when cares goes beyond cares, concerns, to anxious, fearful thoughts, we still need to cast them upon the Lord. He does not reject us from that, but by that. He, he, this is not a cause for him to reject, but a cause for him to manifest his power to build our faith. 
Now, hopefully, this has been an exercise that you've been going through for years, if not decades, and you've built a strong foundation of faith underneath you to where no matter how much water is coming into your boat, you look and you see Jesus resting in the midst of this. You don't sense that he has abandoned us and you were willing to ride this out because he's told us up front, we're crossing over to the other side. He speaks to us in his word from the Apostle Paul and tells us that, that no trial has overtaken us other than that which is common to man. And with the trial, he will always make a way of escape that we might be able to go through it. We go through it with Jesus, and he is sovereign over these circumstances. These circumstances are only <clears throat> permitted and our appearance in the midst of them is orchestrated by his providence and his sovereignty over these circumstances, all things truly do work together for good to those who love God, who are the called according to his purpose. So I want to add another layer to this, that there is purpose in everything that is going on. Uh, I believe that one of the purposes in all of this is to prove once and for all, for those who have eyes to see and ears to hear, of the insufficiency of government to be able to take care of everything. You know, government has its place. Government is established by God. Government is not God. Government is not our supplier. Government is not our healer. Government is not the source of our faith, though, if rightly expressed, it can be a great blessing to be governed in a righteous way with wisdom. For sure, we should be praying for our government in this hour, but we should not be looking to them for the answers. These disciples, as fearful as they were in the midst of their storm, they went to the right place. They went to Jesus for an answer. And when he rose up out of the midst of this boat that he was sleeping in with his disciples, later on in verse 24, he says, And he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water, and they ceased. And there was a calm. The other gospels that speak this story speak of a great calm. I don't know about you, but I've been out on enough lakes in a sudden windstorm, especially I, my mind goes back to one point when I found myself on Carlisle Lake and the wind came down the lake. It says there in verse 23 that a windstorm came down the lake. Now this lake, it didn't. It wasn't a windstorm that came down. It was just a brisk wind. But those of you who've been on that lake, you know that it is very prone to white caps whenever the wind goes down the length of the lake. And it can take a real run at you. And it was very turbulent and a little scary to be out there for sure. They were in the midst of this. And he says, <clears throat> peace, be still. He speaks to the storm and the wind stops blowing. The wind stopping, that, that is an amazing miracle. But the raging of the water stopped as well. And also, those of you who have been out on lakes, just because the wind stops, the waves won't stop for some time. But this was the very unsettling in a good way thing that occurred here was that he had brought his power to bear and there was a sudden calming of the storm. There was a sudden peace that rested upon them and they seen his power. They, they seen his power in that moment. And then he said to them, where is your faith? Where is your faith? They had been walking by sight. They were well, The truth that they were walking in was the truth 
of the storm. They were in the midst of a storm. That reality was their total reality. When they seen Jesus express his authority over the storm, then they seen the power of the one who was in the boat with them. Then they recalled what he told them in that we are going over to the other side. Your destiny is secure. Now in the midst of our storm, I guess what I don't what what I don't want to be heard as to saying <clears throat> is that any day now <coughs> excuse me that any day now we will find ourselves in a place where Jesus raises up and just stops all of this. Stops all of this immediately and we just walk out on the other side in this uh, awestruck wonder. Very well could happen. Absolutely something we should be praying towards. But let's look at this with a, a true perspective. What was Jesus doing in this? He exposed them to a storm for the purpose of revealing his peace, his sovereignty, authority over the things of nature. They were left in awestruck wonder and their faith arose. Their faith increased and that was his purpose in this. And when his purpose was finished, the calming of the storm occurred. And I will guarantee you, when his purpose is finished for this thing that we're going through nationally, when his purpose, or I might say his purposes are finished, he will bring it to a completion. But as long as he has purposes yet to be accomplished in the midst of it, we have to be bolstered by what he's already spoken in his word. We see this story. We see the truth of how secure they were in the midst of a storm when the boat was filling with water. They were absolute, absolutely secure because he was with them. <clears throat> and we are absolutely secure today because he is with us. He has not left us. He has not, he's not abandoned us. He rests. He has perfect peace about exactly where you're at today. And if you are riding high above the storm, just going from faith to faith, and fear hasn't once entered your heart, that's the Lord. That's the Lord. And bless the Lord and thank the Lord. If you are the people that I expressed earlier that are, are fearful and, and are making <clears throat> uh, hasty decisions in the midst of all of this, be sure that he has a purpose in this to increase your faith, to be able to increase your confidence in him to carry you through. The water may be coming up in your boat, and you don't know how much longer you'll be able to take care of this. Just rest in him. He is with you, and we are on a boat that is unsinkable. What comes to my mind when, when I say that is a, a documentary type uh, program that I watched a few years ago, and they were showing some of the the technological advancements that were about the Coast Guard cutters. And there was this special vessel that was created for rough water rescue for the Coast Guard. And they showed these guys going out into seas that I guarantee you would have terrified me to no end. The, the, the waves were multitudes taller than this boat and they would try to orient it directly into the waves and they would ride up over these waves and crash down the other side and then they showed the capability of the boat if they turned sideways 
and the waves would just roll this boat over and over and over again. And then when it would find itself in a swell between, it would pop straight back up. It was watertight. The, the, the water did not get into the boat, even though it had been completely submerged underwater multiple times. It would always right itself, and then it would be under power to go up over the waves again to get out to do their work of rescuing people that were perishing. This is, a, this is kind of a metaphor for the boat that we find ourselves in. The boat that we are in with Christ is unsinkable. And it is made to brave the storms. That's its purpose. The, the purpose of that boat is to brave the storms. And the safest way to go through a storm is straight into it. But even if we get turned sideways, <clears throat> even if we find ourselves reacting in fear and and our whole boat gets just rolled over and over and over and we find ourselves tumbling tumbling seemingly out of control the boat that we are in that that place that we have stepped into where we are doing life with Christ he's in the boat with us even if it doesn't appear that he's active in the moment he is in the boat with us and our boat is unsinkable. Our destiny is sure. And what he is taking us through, he's taking us through for our good and his glory. So as we, even if we find ourselves flipping over and over and over again, you know, our captain truly is in command. And the, the, the key in moments like we find ourselves in today the reason that that Coast Guard cutter does not sink, <clears throat> even in the midst of storms that have it tumbling over and over again, it has the ability to keep the storm on the outside. It may get tumbled and we may get tumbled over and over and over in the midst of this turmoil. The key is stay in the boat we're with Jesus, and we are going through this to the other side for our good and his glory. Keep the storm on the outside. If they open up the hatches on that, they had to get into it somehow. If they open up the hatches and the storm gets in to the inside, it's a whole different level of peril. So we need to keep our eye on the most important thing in this moment. And the most important thing is not uh, how, how the government deals with the return to what they're calling turning the economy back on. You know, that, that may spike the, uh, 